I've made a big fuss in the past, and will do so in the future, about games that hate you. Games that ramp up the difficulty in unfair and obtuse ways with a singular goal of being superior. While I don't believe that every game has the responsibility of being consistently fun, it does have the responsibility of being consistently engaging. Strategy games have to tear at my brain, platforming has to test my reflexes, story has to make me feel, and so on. As soon as the game fails to connect with me, it's literally game over. Snake, are you okay? Snake? Snake? While this usually comes later in a game, like in the Uncharted trilogy, where every single time the monotonous gameplay ends up overshadowing my sense of wonder in connection to the cinematic landscape, any game, especially games that try new things and mechanics or difficulty, need to tread very carefully in its opening hour so that the engagement can be planted in the first place. The best example of this that I can think of is Super Meat Boy. The game's first world, The Forest, functions predominantly like a tutorial, where of the 20 levels, the 8th is the first one where it's realistically possible for you to die more than once or twice. There are saw blades trapped behind walls, ominous collapsing corridors, and a fiery landscape later on, but the danger is mostly for show. The game is teaching you its mechanics here, sure, but it's also teaching you that you should be taking this seriously, because it's about to go really south really quick. The final boss of the forest is far from the hardest level in Super Meat Boy, but it might be the starkest and easily the most notable difficulty spike in the game. The level starts moving, concepts are folded in on each other, and the platforming requires defter fingers than anything that came before it. Most difficult games pride themselves on having a proper difficulty curve because that's the way that is often the most effective at not alienating players. Cuphead, Celeste, and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze are all great examples of this. God, I need to play more games that aren't platformers. But Super Meat Boy did something I hadn't seen at that point. It put up a big, stark barrier and told me to climb it, and if I didn't, I wouldn't go any further. And then something happened, something that I hadn't seen since. I said, bring it on. I never played one of From Software's Soulsborne games until this year. I bought Dark Souls Remastered on the Switch because I'm an irrelevant Nintendo bitch, as we all know, but aside from me trying to maneuver my way through that, I also picked up Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Playing as a shinobi in the middle of Japan's Sengoku period, you slice, stealth, and swing your way through waves of enemies and bosses that seem to have gotten doctorates in the academic field of absolutely wrecking your shit. Yes, Sekiro is an unforgivingly difficult game, designed only for those with a coherent understanding of the game mechanics Hey, that's the name of the show! to pass through. And while this isn't any different from the other games in From's catalog of Hidetaka Miyazaki-directed games, there is a clear progression in how these games would go from cruel to understanding in their use of stark difficulty. From the original Demon's Souls now to Sekiro, the opening hour of these games has been refined to such a point that Sekiro's difficulty is a foolproof concoction that makes me say, bring it on again, also, bring it on, also. As is the want for these games, Sekiro starts with you getting your ass handed to you. However, as opposed to the other Souls games and to an extent Bloodborne, there's a character with a personality and a backstory that's getting their ass handed to them. In Sekiro, when the game's big bad tears your arm off, even if you win the battle the character loses, it's not a gut punch to the player, but a moment of empathy as the character receives that gut punch. It starts off the story as opposed to the first fight in Dark Souls, a game with no real story and no real central character, where the blank slate roleplaying design puts the onus of failure on the player from moment one. Bloodborne doesn't even give you a weapon until you die, asking you to punch a hell beast to death in the first five minutes. I'm not saying the character and world design of Dark Souls or Bloodborne is bad, it's fantastic, especially Bloodborne, but it does stumble especially in these first battles. Once the shinobi wolf gets his master taken away and his hand Luke Skywalkered off his body, Sekiro truly begins, and the point where the failure is the player's fault starts. For the next hour, the player learns the tricky sword combat and how this world functions. There are a few notable mini-bosses and some swarms of enemies that'll probably take you down once or twice, but the difficulty curve is natural. In the early fight with General Naomi Kawarda, the attacks are slow, precise, and easily telegraphed. It's not easy per se, but it's manageable with the player's skill level to that point. At the exact point where the player starts to feel comfortable in Wolf's shoes, you come across a hulking beast, chained up and ready to break loose and strike you and anyone in its way down. This son of a bitch is the Chained Ogre. In my playthrough, I spent about an hour and a half going up against this guy before shutting off my PS4 for the night and calling it a day. This happens sometimes with games that feel adverse to the player. It's hard to stand up to an experience designed to make you fail. But something weird happened. Within 24 hours, I had spent another hour going at this ogre before besting him. I couldn't think about anything else, I just wanted to take this thing and conquer it. And I did. 
Sekiro knows how to perfectly place the game's major barrier to entry so that the player has just enough synergy with the character that the two are distinct entities, but are united in their goals. Wolf wants to kill this ogre to complete his task, we want to kill this ogre because this ogre deserves to die. I think that dissonance is important early on because it keeps the player away from feeling discouraged or beaten down. There's a healthy hour of the game, roughly the amount of time it takes me to get truly invested in the game's world before it gets painful. What makes Sekiro special is that after this point, it never stops being painful. Each boss is another challenge and the difficulty curve now has a new baseline. But once the ogre is defeated, the player feels like anything is possible, so any subsequent beatdowns the game offers are quickly returned. As the player connects more and more to Wolf, the feeling of making it by the skin of your teeth starts to wane. The ogre was beaten, why couldn't I beat the snake? The snake was beaten, what about Lady Butterfly? Lady Butterfly was vanquished, so I can tackle Ishan. And then the game's done. By altering and ostensibly neutering the game's opening failure and pushing back any subsequent failures until much later than in any of the other mentioned Soulsborne games, Sekiro allows for a much more accessible experience. Because the desire to succeed is natural, as opposed to wanting to succeed because apparently these games are great, Davey, and if you want to make videos about games, you need to shut up and play them because nobody will take you seriously if you don't. Or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Wanting to win in Sekiro is natural from the beginning, because the way the game is designed, it's hard not to look at this thing in your way, this ogre, this barrier to the rest of your quest, and say, bring it on. I'm in it to win it. God damn it!